welcome everyone who's here and who, who's here online to um, Sox's uh, panel on how to build diversity in collections. Um, so we have our lovely panelists here. You guys want to um, introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Um, I'm Christiana Obrano. Um, I'm a new catalog librarian Thank you so much for being here um, for National Library Week. It's really great to get to discuss something that um, is near and dear to us. Um, so, uh, you can jump into questions or follow along with the conversation. Oh, no. Uh, so, Go ahead. And, um, hi, everyone. I would also like to introduce our third panelist who is not able to join with us today. She will be, they will be on video, Nicole Cunha, uh, at Newton Library. Um, and we'll start with some introductions if you guys would like to introduce yourself more um, about why you, you know, are interested in doing this panel or any projects that you've done with diversity, creating diversity in collections especially. And this is collections for libraries, for special libraries, academic libraries, archives, um, anything where we can create, you know, have that intersectional lens uh, focused on our collections. So, um, uh, Renata, would you like to start on that? Sure. Um, I've actually only been here for about nine months. Um, prior to that, I was working at USC um, in their dental library. And as part of that, um, our main focus is really on the dental students and faculty making sure that we have content in the collection for them. However, we also have dental hygiene students as well. And what they do is go out to elementary schools and middle schools and talk to children about dental hygiene, how to brush their teeth, take care of their teeth, flossing. Something that some of the students pointed out is that our collection was not diverse in terms of the books that we had. So part of my job, and I was the only librarian there, it's a small, special library, um, was to go and try to find uh, books that were more diverse. They have, there's a very large Spanish-speaking uh, population in Los Angeles. So the University of Maryland actually had a good collection, and what I did, and my boss recommended this, was to look at their collection, look at the books that they had there, and make decisions about what we should purchase for our collection to update that. So when the dental hygiene students are going out and talking to children in classes, that they are able to um, use various books from people from different backgrounds. And I think that's something that really helped our collection and focusing on that. So sometimes it's having students come up and say, well, your collection is not as diverse as it should be. We need to um, do better, updated, and so that really helped having that input for them. Um, Thank you. Yeah, getting feedback from the population you're serving must be really useful. Yes. Uh, do you want to expand on your work, Christina? Sure. Okay. I brought pictures. I don't know if you can find them. Yes. I really like um, when people bring like practical ideas. I work at a public library um, and I'm a cataloging librarian now at the public library of Brooklyn um, branch in Brooklyn Village, but before that I was library assistant at the Coolidge Corner branch. Um, and I brought some of the like materials that I've made for the last few months at Coolidge Quarters display section um, and just like some cool brainstorming ideas. Quincy liked them, so I brought them. <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully they're cool. Um, so MLK Day, we did books that break the silence. I wanted to focus on sort of the words of MLK rather than 
this sort of figure of MLK that I think sometimes obscures the actual works and thoughts that he did. Um, and I also wanted to focus on action rather than, um, I think like a lot of displays tend to be very inactive things, um, and I'm interested in finding ways to make them more interactive for people. So that month we did these little handouts on the side that had information about how to make calls to your representatives um, and a list of phone numbers of legislators if you live in Brookline um, so that you can make it as easy as possible for people to actually act on the books that we're asking them to read. Um, I don't know how well it's circulated because I lost track of the numbers, but I like the idea of it. And I'd love to hear what people think and if they've done anything similar. Um, what else did I put on here? Cool. Similarly, for Valentine's Day, we had a love is love is love display. And this one went over super well, which was awesome. And we gave out the full LGBTQ IA plus extra letters um, and little handouts that people could take, and a lot of people took those, which was super awesome. Um, and I think introduced a lot of people to some of the letters that tend to get chopped off. Um, and it's really tricky to find those. Coolidge Corner is really small, so we can't keep a lot of books, and there's not a lot of books published on, um, say, two spirit people. Um, so another thing that I did for this display was to give out little lists, which you can see in the top left, I think, um, of books that you could order from other libraries on two spirit people because we didn't have anything in the collection and I didn't have any collection development authority at the time. Um, so I think that's like a helpful idea um, if you are not in a situation where you can be contributing to collection development or maybe there's just not material existing in the publishing world as it is right now. Um, and I think I have one more thing. Oh, and this was our uh, mystery with the badass broad. We ha are having because we she came last month to talk about her new book, so this was a spin-off of that. Um, but we did mystery dates, so we wrapped all of our books with brown paper, which was a great way to get some biographies off the shelf. Um, if you've ever tried to circulate biographies, it's really hard because they're ugly and no one wants to take them out. Um, and it's a great way to make them look a little nicer and get people, kind of trick them into taking out things that they are not, would not normally have picked up on their own. Um, and then the last thing that I have on here is just samples of like spreadsheets that I use. I'm like a super big proponent of this. Um, I am a white girl, I'm married to a guy, um, and I think it's really important to make um, the choices that we're making as, visual to, as visible to ourselves as possible when making displays. So I like to really analyze which books I'm putting on the shelf um, by a lot of different race and social class everything that I can kind of work on um, so I can visibly see where I might be favoring one area over another and certain groups of people over other groups of people. Um, yeah. Thanks. Sorry, I talked too much. <laughs> no, it was all really great to hear about uh, the work in the field. So what I'm hearing is that we're getting collection development um, introduced by your patrons, and also collection development either from um, our own like uh, our visible uh, collection development, and also from other libraries if our collection doesn't have it, which is really cool. Um, and I'd also like to show now our video from Nicole Cunha, who is doing a research project on. Um, disability portrayals in children's literature. Um, and so here is our last video. It's about six minutes. Hi everyone. 
everyone, my name is Nicole Kuna, and I'm a public, public services librarian at the Newton Free Library and a public services assistant at the Wheelock College Earl Center for Learning and Innovation. That's better. Okay. Um, I started looking at children's and young adult literature through a disability lens when I was at Simmons. I have a transcript here, so I'll keep looking down. Um, several classes discussed. The lack, the lack of ethnic and gender representation in this literature, but there wasn't really a discussion of disability representation in this literature. Um, or the intersectionality of disability with race and gender. That's also very important because it is real. Um, though I can't remember the exact moment I was integrating a disability lens into all I do, um, fair warning, uh, the desire to change the way people um, are in and outside of higher education and think outside of this sphere uh, and how they examine disability has only grown. Let's start slow, shall we? Uh, the first stop was looking at the treatment of disability and disability or disabled characters through, th through science fiction and fantasy. It's a really good way of doing it and starting slow. Um, are we active characters or pl plot devices? Think of Colin in the circuit garden. Was he an active character or did he just let his disability define him? Does the disability itself propel the plot? Uh, for example, humanity of cyborgs or robots, those with PTSD, like in the Hunger Games, etc. And how is this ability treated within the world of the work itself? Keep this in mind. Uh, before anything can get done, however, there was the task of breaking down. <clears throat> Excuse me, breaking down the models of disability and the applications of between the fictional and factional world. There are two models, medical model and social model. The medical model is focusing on managing one's disability within the medical sphere um, and how the medical professional defines that disability. Does the medical professional think everything is normal or do they think of it as other? And the social model is what behaviors and barriers are perpetuated in everyday culture. Be bear with me, the examples are coming. That's really important when you're first starting out. Um, once I understood how to apply a disability lens to an other constructed world, the application naturally expanded to the real world, as we call this reality that we know. Um, how are people with disabilities treated in the United States and, and worldwide? Does the treatment differ from country to continent or within each country within the continent? Either way. Uh, what laws in place affect those um, people with disabilities in each place? How they are treated, perceived, um, and in their places of social hierarchies? Are they in the lower rungs or do they actually have a sense of power in these places? Um, how does the medical field treat these individuals and what terminology do they use and prefer? A disabled person, autistic person, person with a disability, wheelchair user, crip, Though so that's mainly used within the disability community itself. Kind of like, um, it's a reclamation and reclaiming of that word. Like, communities of color, uh, mainly African American communities, may use the N word. I'm just trying to use it as a um, comparative. I mean, no disrespect. Uh, and I often wonder why academics are writing these articles about disability 
representation in the literature in YA and children's because there's no impact of the characterizations and no application to the world as a whole. Uh, take Wonder, for instance. R.J. Palacio wrote the book as a reaction to her guilt when encountering a young girl with craniofacial disfigurement. There's a um, more exact terminology, but uh, craniofacial disfigurement is the general term because there are several within that umbrella. She did not consult any families or individuals with these impairments. Yet, the book has become a teaching tool for children and adults who want to make others aware of their experiences. True story. Though some people in this group found comfort in finding ways to share their experiences, the treatment of disability goes beyond the book. The disability community still needs to deal with the tropes and stereotypes depicted in the Hollywood films, and wonder is no exception. There are a lot of ways I could talk about this. I'm going to start there. Um, the problem here is twofold. The casting directors uh, chose a non-disabled actor to play a disabled character. So he does not have that lived experience that people with craniofacial disfigurements disfigurements may have. I'm talking too fast, pardon me. Um, and then Augie's character becomes a model of inspiration porn by the end of the film. It was pretty good until then, but then it just kind of dropped the bomb. Ugh. <laughs> anyway, inspiration porn happens when a person with a disability is found to be exceptional solely because of their disability. Uh, if you want to learn more, I'd recommend checking out Stella Young's 2014 TED Talk. She really goes in on it um, and explains how she experienced it and how um, it impacted her in her home country and continent of Australia. Make a point to remind yourselves of the literature's influence and remember how characterization is found to, found in what we read and how it informs one's bias or perception of a community. And most importantly, educate yourselves to combat these types of thinking. That's how I started and that's how it's kind of ballooned, blossomed, whatever you want to call it, into um, my integrative teaching and hands-on teaching that I do now. So if you have questions, let me know. Video number two coming your way. Um, so what I'm hearing from that is self-education is important um, and also awareness of the collection and tropes that might be in it. Um, the second video will be posted alongside this recording, um, unless there's extra time at the end. Back to you, Elise. Thank you, Quincy. Um, so we have some questions for you to, uh, to feel, um, converse, uh, and for the audience to get to um, what, uh, what you all think about building uh, diversity in collections. So, uh, start off with that, we're all students in this room, um, eventually going into work that might involve um, building collections or working on collection policy. Um, so what are some, what are two or three major ways uh, that students can make uh, a substantial difference really being aware of what's out there, being aware of different resources that are um, out there. Something that I was just looking at is um, a website called We Need Diverse Books .org, mm -hmm. and that's a good website to look at in terms of looking at content that's covering um, books from different viewpoints, um, be that racial or ethnic backgrounds, um, 
gender, religion, as well as sexual orientation um, and disability. So being familiar with what resources are there um, and trying to seek those out. Um, in addition to that, thinking about, um, and Christiana talked about this, thinking, thinking about your own viewpoint, your own standpoint, where you're looking at things from, and um, acknowledging that there are other viewpoints out there, there are other people out there. So I'd also say to look and see what other libraries are doing. Can their collections look online? What do they have available? Um, what type of library are you interested in working in? So look at websites that are like that. Even if you're interested in looking, um, working in an academic library, even look at public libraries because a lot of times the resources that they do have in their collection do overlap. So seeing what's out there, seeing what's available, making yourself um, knowledgeable, and also talking to people. Um, going to professional um, conferences helps. So talking to people, seeing what they're talking about, if there are any sessions on collections and diversity, going to those, listening to people, going up to the presenters, talking to them as well. Um, and getting out there, talking, knowing what you want to do, and, and really um, seeing the need for it. The more that you're into it, you see the need for the diversity and diversity and collections, the more you'll be into trying to put forth an effort to make sure that wherever you're working, that diversity is there. Great. I just had like a follow-up question. Was there, for you in your career, was there like a specific um, conference or like talk that like just really hit home on like the work that you do? I've, I've attended two diversity, collect, uh, two diversity conferences the Joint Conference for Librarians of Color. I actually attended that when I was a doctoral student. Um, that's coming up again in uh, this year in September. And the National Diversity and Libraries Conference was at UCLA two years ago. So that really focuses on people coming at issues from a different standpoint. Um, they're all very interested in diversity, so that's what they're focusing on. And it really energizes you like, yes, I do need to do more. I do need to really think about what we do have available, our patrons, and not just our patrons. And one of my students mentioned this um, yesterday. She was like, it's the people who are in the library already know what's there. It's those who are outside of the library that we also need to pay attention to as well. Because usually it's like, oh, we have this group, so let's make sure we continue to have content for them. Well, what about people who aren't in the library? What can we have in our collection so that we can bring others in? Great. So, Krishna, do you have anything to add for students um, who want to get it? Yeah, um, I want to like double the plug for Weedy Diverse Books. I give that website to everyone. They have a list of resources that is a list of like 50 blogs run by different communities that give out their own reward lists. Um, which are really good supplements to things like Yalsa um, to pick books that are not about white kids. Um, and also, I think looking at your own media diet in your own life, um, it's hard to ask people to go outside their comfort zones if you are not going outside of your comfort zone. Um, so really thinking about whose voices you're listening to on a day-to-day -day basis what you're reading and the podcast you're listening to. Um, even just in a practical sense, if someone comes up to you for a reader's advisory and you read the same kinds of books all the time, those are going to be the books that you pass on to the next patron. Um, and so if you want diversity in other people's reading, it has to start being yours. <laughs> That's a great comment, especially like in the light of, I mean, like Facebook's constant rebuilding on um, like analyzing past content and like that's all you get. You get one story um, in all of your social platforms and that's a lot of the time. It's a big place where people ingest um, you know social content. So, yeah, great um, Is there I know you talked about briefly professionally about great resources or do you have any other things that you do in your professional life? Um, that might differ from what a student would do when it comes to thinking about diversity in conferences. It's a little of the same. Um, for my 
myself, I try to stay current because I'm out of actually practicing as a librarian right now. Um, so seeing what's out there and is there anything new? Um, what is it that I can bring in and really um, help someone learn about or really something that they may not be aware of um, that they can use? So I have to go back again to conferences and not just going to diversity conferences, but usually with any um, professional conferences, there are sessions on diversity, so making sure that you are attending those and also um, thinking about what you can do as a student. Um, even now, if you're interested in that, why are you interested in that? What is it that you can do pushing yourself to do more? So, it feels more like, I think when I feel like I'm doing a better job, it feels more, like, it feels like work. And I feel like sometimes it feels like talking about nice ideas in school. Um, and when I'm actually in the field, it means doing a lot of research and reading a lot of reviews, and a lot of the reviews are not easy to find. Um, Library Journal is not a very diverse publication, um, especially depending on the genre area and the subject area. Um, the religion section is pretty much like one, one audience there. I did, um, I did the 200s for the Suffolk County prison. I updated that for them, and it was really hard um, because there's not good publications. So like, when you're in the field, if you're doing it right, it's hard, and you're mad at the publication industry. And if you're not angry at them, then you're not <laughs> looking at it very closely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everyone gets very angry. <laughs> hey, girl, that's it. Cool. Um, um, Rebecca, you mentioned uh, in the answer to the last question um, when you're wanting to self educate, look at other libraries to see what they're doing. So, to both of you, Christiana and Rebecca, um, are there like libraries that you go to to like check out what they're doing? Because they're just doing fabulous work. Well, I was just looking at uh, the website for San Francisco's public library, and I think they do a very good job in terms of their collection and breaking it down not only by um, for diversity in terms of a lot of times we think diversity, we think of race and ethnicity, but of course it's much more than that. It's gender, disability, sexual orientation, religion, but also the content. Um, thinking about people who do have disabilities, so. Do we have books that are in print? Do you have them electronically? Um, do you have audio books? Even if you have something that's available online, and they do this here at Simmons as well with the um, some of the articles in the database, you can read them, or not read them, but listen to them. So that's good for those who are um, really auditory learners that would like to hear it instead of going through and reading it. So thinking about the different ways and the different formats that content is available as well. So that's something I also um, look for with librarians. Great, yeah, that's something I hadn't thought about. It's really um, The Simmons, uh, the librarians are the coolest people in the world and everybody should go to the Seed Fest in a couple of weeks. It's gonna be really cool. Um, but I think also makes me think about the ways that we can diversify the sources of publications and materials. Um, we got an awesome donation from an LGBTQ plus um, publishing house in the Boston area when I was in Suffolk County. And they sent us these super cool like LGBTQ coloring books for my coloring book program. It was awesome as well as a bunch of published materials and thinking about how you can diversify your vendors once you're out in the field I think can be really helpful. It also means you're putting money back in the local community, which is always super good, um, instead of to some of the bigger publishing vendors. Um, and I don't know if you put it on the <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
lucky you can remember. Yeah. <laughs> Just say anytime. Um, Oh, okay, great. Tell us. <laughs> because the San Francisco Public Library, which is awesome, also works with, um, has worked with other organizations outside of libraries, and I think that's really cool. Like, look, read education texts and what they're doing. Um, I was really lucky to be able to work with Dr. Conrad Smith on um, studies of media literacy education and community media centers. Um, and some of those folks are doing really, really awesome stuff with diversity and media and teaching kids how to tell their own stories and advocate for themselves and their communities. Um, the Bay Area Video Coalition, who works in San Francisco, is like a super awesome example of that um, and doing youth development work and Think about how you bring that. I'm like, I do a lot of teen stuff, so sorry, I'm like kind of youth focused. Um, but thinking about how to bring those processes into the library field, I think, is really like, exciting to think about in the future. Yeah, thinking about time movement um, and where where we've been with um, uh, diversity uh, in this world and in libraries. Can you um, maybe talk about what you've noticed that's changed in the past five years about like how um, diversity um, and collection management, like the intersection of that, how has it changed? I think people are more aware of that now and really think about that more when they are managing their collections. Do we have content that is representing um, our community, the people that we are serving, and even those who are outside of um, our community that can come in and actually see what the library is offering. So I think being more aware of what we do have um, is something that's come to the forefront, and people are more vocal about that as well. So that pushes you as well when you have people who are calling you out and saying, you don't have this in your collection. Why don't you have this in your collection? Um, we'd like for you to include this content that also really pushes you and forces you to um, include uh, what you may not have had in there in the past. So I think people are more willing to speak up and speak out, and that's what we need. And sometimes it is putting in, and it is hard work, putting in that work and pushing yourself and challenging yourself and saying, no, this may be, I have to step outside of my comfort zone. That's one of the best things that you could ever do. So that's helped to really change in terms of collection management and what's going on in terms of diversifying um, our collections and libraries. Yeah, I think the, the community support is by, obviously, with the situation where we are in the country, it's by no means unilateral, but has been more noticeable in the last few years than I've seen it before, like to have people verbally acknowledge efforts that you're making um, and really be appreciative of them and that gives you a lot more push when you're trying to make those changes. Um, I also kept track of all of the books that were checked out from my display so that I could demonstrate which books, like demonstrating circulation is like the number one thing that you need to do um, and that's like the number one pushback that I tend to get is that like all oh, that books ideas, but it's just not going to circulate. Um, and so getting those sort numbers and being able to demonstrate that this matters to the community and not just to me because like I'm trying to be some kind of like good person. Um, but we can see. Yeah, like we like people want it and it matters and people appreciate when it's there. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I'm hearing a lot of like um, what we touched on before, like really patron base and their voices have uh, increased uh, in, in the past couple of years. Can you maybe like predict what could happen? <laughs> I don't know. What <laughs> predict what could happen? I've been working in libraries for a long time, so you can maybe predict or maybe um, tell us about like 
a real critical change um, that needs to happen to really up um, like libraries' considerations in collection management and maybe even like patrons' consideration. The normalization of diversity as a standard, not as a bonus point thing. Because <laughs> um, I think there's still some of that. Um, and it's like you end up with the, the once a year display kind of thing. Um, and very little representation So making that a standard of the collection development policy and a standard of the books of the library is going to be promoting in displays and in talking to the talking public about that, I think can get better um, and would be really good. <laughs> I also think changing our attitudes as well as um, information professionals because everyone in the profession is not diversity so that also inhibits the collections of what we do have so I'm really thinking about this is it's not our library it doesn't belong to us like I never walked and said this is Rebecca's library <laughs> this is everything that I want to no. know um, you really have to change your that your attitude and of course the only person we can control is ourselves so it comes with really thinking about how is this making the library better how am I um, how are we trying to better serve patrons and um, show that we are inclusive in terms of our collection? It's normalizing and normalizing the process where you're working and for your coworkers. Yeah, um, it's gonna take some work and some time, <laughs> but hopefully we'll get there someday. Um, <laughs> Just do that in five to ten. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so we can have another panel and talk about. Yeah, what's next? Yeah, let's go. Um, so, uh, like conversely, um, do you do either of you have like a specific experience um, where you wish like uh, either an organization you work for or that you have like participated in, had some contact with, had done something differently uh, in terms of their management? displays of books in the dental library. It was more of the content that people have <laughs> donated over the years or it's from their collection. Um, I wish that we did more in terms of, because um, in the past, uh, the dental profession is um, really more oriented with men. So men were pretty much there um, in terms of being at the forefront. and. With students and seeing the incoming students, is I noticed that it's definitely more half and half. It's more 50-50 in terms of women coming in. So seeing more about them, and I wish that we had more displays of content and books that were written by them and what they have done there. So it's really kind of thinking in hindsight, like, oh, that would have been a good idea because we do have, there is a change and seeing that there and um, putting that forth because it does help to actually see people who have done things like you and seen um, those that are similar and also seeing things from different perspectives. So I wish that's something that we did at once at the Or displays with content uh, and that women have written uh, what they've done. Um, I don't know if I have I'd like to see, um, like, I've been in libraries that I think could do more thoughtful, like, on the other end of collection development is weeding, and a lot of weeding is very, for time reasons, for, for legitimate staff limitation reasons, is very circulation dependent, um, and having done some weeding on my own now, I worry about the way that that forces a lot of bias that exists in communities and maybe leaves on the shelf some really problematic material from 30 years ago 
um, in preference for removing material that's actually much more um, up to date and accurate representations of things in particularly in history section. Um, people kind of attach themselves to their history books. Of them go. So they have really high search numbers from these 50 year old books, but like um, I'm a little skeptical that the, that the language and the spin on that material is as accurate as it needs to be. Um, but it takes time and it takes a lot of time to really go through material on a content basis, especially in the nonfiction section, um, and finding ways to, I think, like find ways to do little bits of that on your own. Um, you take five books off the shelf every couple of weeks and actually look at them and make sure that um, that's the thing that should be there. Right, those are both. Um, I was just learning so much about like when I get a job someday and like keep these considerations in the back of my mind. Because um, yeah, so far at least I haven't had Policy, I don't know uh, for people in the audience um, the experience that they had, but like we've only like briefly talked about like collection policy and patron input um, and not like other like, really hardcore things. So maybe I'll call my professor <laughs> uh, when I have class later. Um, so um, we talk about uh, you know, as people and as librarians. So. Um, what do you do to uh, continue your work um, and to keep what lights the fire to, to keep thinking about these issues and keep pushing for these issues? I'm really seeing the need for it. Um, like I mentioned before, you have to see the need for it and really put yourself out there. And seeing that I am uh, teaching future librarians, also talking to them as well. But in as much as I'm talking to them, it's like how much is actually getting in and sinking in. So you don't know that, but at least mentioning it. So you do, you are planting that little seed there where you are mentioning that, yes, you do need to think about diversity. You do need to think about that with your collection, with your patrons, um, what needs to be there. And being observant, I think that's something that's very important. Wherever I go, I usually observe what's going on, what do we have and um, seeing what is there in your collection. So a lot of the times that with new jobs, it's going into librarianship, it's all, a lot of it is learning on the job. So going in and seeing, okay, what's in the collection, becoming familiar with that, and saying, well, what's missing? What else do we need? What can we add? Um, and that may be taking small steps, that may be looking at your collection development policy and seeing where you can make changes um, if there's no collection development policy, saying, oh, we need to develop one and we need to include something about diversity. So um, being there, noticing those things, what you can do, and again, this goes with speaking up and speaking out and saying, this is why it's needed, this is what we need to do, here are the steps we can take. And you don't have to do that alone, you can do that with your colleagues as well. As I mentioned um, before, always looking and seeing what's being done in other libraries because there are other libraries that are doing it and doing it very well. And um, speaking with people, speaking with other librarians around and stepping outside of librarianship. So speaking to teachers, speaking to people in psychology, um, speaking to those people who, and asking them, what are you all doing in terms of the content that you need? Because you all, we will also have content from their fields as well in your collection and they are familiar with what's going on and what's out there. So that helps you as well getting that input from them. Yeah, I think the I've been really amazed at the positive reception on the things that the little things that I have done, which have been like like it's not <laughs> that's my job <laughs> um, and you don't do I don't think you should do things so that people like think that some people are great um, but 
yeah, like the need is very apparent. Um, and I didn't expect it to be as, um, as like people coming up to me and being like, oh my gosh, like, are there, are there books about trans people on this display? And being able to say yes and seeing what's on the fix is like, like really heartbreaking. <laughs> Um, because that means we should have been doing this so long ago, and it's so ridiculous. So, like, the laundry list of things that isn't done, <laughs> um, and that should have been done, you know, 20 years ago, um, to make people feel comfortable in the library and feel like their stories to relate to. Um, like, that's why I want to be a librarian, is to give people stories that help them navigate their lives and think about the world and there's just this big gap of things that we really haven't done that very well on in the history of librarianship. So so we're here. <laughs> so we're gonna have to be um, so uh, that's it for my prepared questions. So thank you so much for taking the time to dive deep with them. Um, we're gonna open it up to our audience here, see if they have any questions for you. Yeah. Hi. So I have a question for Christiana because I live in the corner. Um, and I was wondering, like, um, when you were talking about your patron base um, and how like certain things are in circulation, um, even though they might be like, you know, old and inaccurate in some regard. What like what would you say the largest base of patrons was in Blue Corner? Because like, it is a very diverse neighborhood, and it is like there the collections there I have found to be linguistically diverse at the very least. But like, is it mostly old white people, or is are there people from other communities coming also? Uh, the Blue Corner Library has a huge um, Chinese American yeah. patron base. Um, are starting to respond to that um, and it's very overdue um, and we're really excited to be doing that um, so we just hired a Chinese language cataloger um, so the books will well uh, the books were less of the problem the DVDs in Chinese will be on the shelf in a way that makes sense and not by number that we acquired them which was <laughs> what it was because we did not have that position um, and we're super grateful that our director has been able to make space for that, um, and it's, we're really excited to be able to do that, and we have really awesome people making new stuff happen. Um, and Coolidge actually has undergone like an amazing weed, everything is looking so much better, and we're about to undergo a renovation, so we're really excited about Coolidge. Nice. Um, so we're going to do a relaunch of the World Language Collection, it's going to be super cool, um, and it's going to be beautiful, and we're really excited. <laughs> We just got the okay on that, so yeah. Um, um, I, uh, and I'm sorry, because also I live in your cool corner. <laughs> so, <laughs> no questions about dentistry? <laughs> um, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. actually. Very, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so this this is also applicable to special libraries, and it's sort of about the physical appearance of libraries. So I guess we're straying a little bit from collections, but I did notice that in the the two single stall bathrooms for um, Coolidge Corner had specifically a like um, gender neutral sign on it, um, and specifically said like you know all all genders and all sexual expression is welcome, um, something to that to that effect. I mean, how does that, how would that be incorporated into an academic library or a special library, and does, what kind of effect do you think that has? Um, I mean, not just for bathrooms, but also for any other sort of like signage, signage, my question is signage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I like signs too much, I put way too many up, and it like probably causes more confusion. Um, yeah, so we're in the process of translating, going back to Chinese collection, we've also started translating our wine labels into the language that is in the book. You know, that's good. Um, <laughs> so that's exciting. Um, and 
we're fortunate to have some people who can help us out with that. Mm -hmm. um, we, the town of Brooklyn, I can't, I'm not sure who, how the, the bathroom science got investigated. Um, they're great and we're really fortunate to have already had single stall bathrooms um, because that makes it smoother um, and less people get mad at us. Um, and, but the town of Brookline officially instituted a policy that all um, town employees will include pronouns in their email signatures, um, which has also been a really big deal. And everybody at the library um, also just voluntarily added them to their badges. Um, I think that's been really appreciated, especially um, by like current employees who do have that. And we're probably constantly misgendering before that, even you know, by patrons. Um, and now we say things like, hey, maybe don't. Um, thank you. <laughs> in a very nice way. So um, I hope it makes it more welcome. Mm -hmm. um, and we try to invite people in to give us feedback on things like that um, and keep working to be better. I mean, were there were there other language collections in the dentistry school that, or, or per, perhaps a potential to, for there to be? There's definitely potential for uh, there to be other language collections in, um, in the library. Unfortunately, there was not. Um, in terms of signage, they did just switch over to gender neutral um, bathrooms in the library last year. And that I think was the last <coughs> one to switch over because the School of Dentistry had already done that before. Um, unfortunately, the dental library was kind of hidden. We were in the basement. So usually only students and faculty members knew about us, but we had um, community members that came into the clinic, which was on the first floor. So sometimes they would come in and ask questions. But in terms of our um, collection of language, that's an area which we definitely need to Yeah, it's very interesting thinking about like, the period of talk to talk, walk the walk. Like reading, so we talk about like public libraries, but special libraries tend not to read as much. So I was just wondering, um, for Rebecca, like how, like, if you did read, how did you do, like, go around it? Was it just update the information in there, or is it um, in the community? When your students said, like, they would like some Spanish language education materials, is that like, an opportunity to, like, oh, here's an English one that's updated on? <laughs> well, in terms of the educational um, content, when we looked at that and when I looked at the list and um, send it on to the technical services assistant and suggesting the books that we should purchase, um, the older books were discarded because they were older, um, but with special libraries, a lot of the content that we have we do keep because there aren't many dental libraries in the world. and. With, especially with print content, it's like, well, there may not be another library with this, but if someone comes to ask those questions. So we were in the process of starting to think about a weeding. <laughs> 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 no. um, starting to think about planning um, weeding. I'm not sure if that has been done yet, but we definitely needed to because with our um, journals, the shelves were packed and there's really no more room. So that's something we had to think about because we weren't binding any more journals. We had a bound journal and we're not binding anymore. And we were cutting back on our print collection. So that's something we discussed. Something that we did talk about during one of our staff meetings was um, when we were going to weed, the content that we were going to get rid of, we were going to do that at night because people get very upset when they see that you're just discarding books. And they're like, why are you throwing books out? So that is something that we did discuss when we were going to start and like, that content would be put in the back at night so people didn't see it. Um, with the vendors, because that's a common trend that a lot of people gave away for print and journals um, and moving on to just the online access. Was there like a consensus 
wearing. Um, I know students have come across this in other libraries as well about having like because if you have a different copy, you have it. You don't have to worry about if they're if the vendor's going to nick something from their package the next year. Is that like a consideration in your using um, the movement to print online? Um. Possibly. <laughs> I think so, yes, because we did, well, we did want to make sure that we did have the content there in print, so it's also thinking about, well, looking at usage too, as Christiana mm -hmm. um, talked about with circulation, so how many people are actually using this, um, is it available electronically, if it is, can we access that, can we have that, what are we going to do with the print? Are we going to keep it here? Are we going to send it to storage or somewhere? So that was always uh, a discussion that was had and something that we definitely are hopefully is being taken care of um, now or there are plans to do that. But with print and online, that's always a, a discussion in terms of meeting. Should we keep print? Should we not? I know that. Um, we were talking to one of the libraries at NYU and he said when Hurricane Sandy came through that pretty much wiped out their print collection and the director decided they're not going to have any more print, we're not acquiring it, it's going to be all electronic. So in that sense, some, it comes down to, well, we did have print, now we don't. And so that makes it even more important for those libraries that do have print to keep them and not get rid of them during a weeding process. Uh, it is a little bit past your time, so uh, I think it's a great place to end. Um, so thank you so much, Christiana and Rebecca, for coming here and um, talking with us. Um, and Nicole. And Nicole, yes. Lovely talking about um, uh, disability in collections. I actually, I've read a lot of books. She, she was talking about. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'd like also to mention thank you so much for our audience to come and for our viewers who are viewing. Um, there will be a recording made available on the Sliss Tech YouTube channel. Thank you so much to Sliss Media Lab. Um, and yeah, this was a really great panel and I'm really excited for all the ideas that were generated here. Yeah, great panel. Um, Round of applause for our panelists. It depends on what you mean by a good portrayal of disability. If you meet one person with a disability, you've met one person, one person with a disability, and they have a vastly different view than another person with a disability and a non-disabled person. What a non-disabled person thinks is a good portrayal can be completely inaccurate uh, due to the lack of research and stereotypes. Uh, perpetuated through characterization. See video one for more info. Uh, keep in mind that all the author's ties to the community they're representing and their level of ties. Um, are they able to pass? Are, is their disability physical, mental, invisible? Um, if you read El Depo by C.C. Bell, you may have an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, the author becomes deaf at a young age, but not before she's lived in a hearing world. Um, I think she went deaf by the age of four, so she had some um, experience talking prior to this. She grapples with passing as able-bodied, and her, um, her devices that help her hear. Fighting her new identity, and also finding the humor in it even after the fact, because this is an adult going back to her childhood. Everything we have, our thoughts, our realities are constructed. Who knows? Um, some people who you perceive as disabled do not identify that way. I didn't know how to, dis how to identify until I found the community in college. Uh, that took a while. Um, good portrayals of disability, as I define them, are ones that make you question 
new beliefs about the disability community, about their capabilities, and your own perception of normal. Everyone has their own normal, their own way of doing things. If someone who uses a wheelchair um, can get around in their hands, that's how they get around. They don't have to use the wheelchair if they don't want to. Um, someone like myself with mobility impairments that aren't as um, noticeable until I get tired, that's my normal. I have to gauge my energy level. So, And remember that representation matters. We've talked about this long enough. We're actively searching for books with LGBTQIA, whatever acronym you prefer, and main characters of color. Um, let's talk about love is a great example. Uh, by it's by Claire Kahn. I just read it. Amazing as an asexual. It really hit the nail on the head. Back to the topic at hand. Um, the communities we serve, disabled or not, have or should have easy access to these resources even before they go looking for them. In my research journey, I've come across some issues where the books and articles I've needed have been across the country, across the world. One was from Germany, if memory serves. Um, as educators, we should be fighting for this even before we think that our communities will need the resources. Anticipate the need, and your need, for access. The battles do go beyond the books. As librarians, we aim to promote an informed citizenry, and that includes us, like I just said. If you're doing a movie night program, check to see if the film or episode has captions and audio description uh, for anyone who's deafblind, blind, blind uh, hard of hearing, anyway. Are right, promotional materials in Braille? Can the patrons access the space where the program is by an elevator, or is it stairs only? Start a book club where you discuss and blah, discuss and the book itself and the disability representation within it. Or if it doesn't have disability representation at all, can you apply a disability lens to that narrative? Um, one of my most recent ones was Beauty and the Beast with a social disability lens. Are the titles available on audiobook? Again, we want to anticipate a patron's need before they realize they need something. Don't force them to out themselves, like you wouldn't with someone who identifies as queer or is questioning. Um, you want these children, teens, and even adults to explore the collections without feeling uneasy. It's all about a learning experience. Even for the folks like me who live it, I have my own experience, but I don't know what it's like to be deafblind with Tourette's syndrome, to be a person of color who is also autistic, though there's also, <clears throat> also an, an anthology that's out as of last year, that's really good. I recommend it all the way to our dreams. Um, anyway, I'm rambling at this point. Thank you. I had a great time, or I uh, speculate that I will have. And reach out if you have any questions. Have a good day, and um, I'll see you on the other side. Have a good one.